creates his own offensive chance with that motor. Krejci to Coyle! And the Leafs are moved again! Hey there, welcome to the Nesson Bruins podcast from Nesson.com's Mike Cole, joined as always by Nesson.com's Logan Mullen. Logan, how you doing? I'm good, Mike. I'm good. Hanging in there? I'm hanging in there. How are you? Uh, not bad, I suppose. It's uh, another day just like the rest. Yep. <laughs> yeah. As we, uh, we continue to plot uh, along here. Um, you and I will uh, discuss a few things this week. Uh, we will do, a, as we have been doing, as uh, now is tradition for us, we will do an update on the NHL season, which is still paused. It is, it, there. it is impressive that we've actually had, even if it's – a relatively minor piece of news that we've had some sort of like actual update every week. Yeah, that's true. And for I think some sort of good. report. That'll probably continue. I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean, everybody's looking for news at this point. So uh, yeah. I think people are probably bored. So they're just going to talk to reporters just for, you know, something to yeah, do. Why not? Uh, but yeah, we will, uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk about that real quick. And then we'll also get into uh, similar to what we did last week where we went over the Bruins goalie situation. Uh, you and I will dig into the uh, the defense core uh, and kind of reassess where things stand there, uh, try to figure out where they might be, if and when they come back, and also project forward, kind of jumping off of a, a few things that Tori Krug said uh, earlier this week on a, a Zoom conference call with uh, reporters, uh, of which you were one of uh, involved yeah. in the, uh, the process. Zoom, though. Look at us. We're just like the pros. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, so – I guess the big story this week is that uh, there is no no return yet. Uh, hockey is not back, um, but it sounds like you know the the powers that be are trying to make it possible. Uh, the biggest um, piece of news, if you want to call it that, more or less speculation, I guess I don't know. Uh, but uh, Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman reported this week that uh, one location uh, that has been mentioned, if the if the Bru- or, excuse me, the NHL is going to do a centralized return uh, and play all their games in one location uh one of those spots that has been mentioned is north dakota which may sound weird but it's not at all i mean obviously the university of north dakota has a a strong uh, college hockey lineage uh the ralph engelstad arena is is actually really nice i was looking at pictures of it earlier uh in terms of you know a college hockey arena it's it's as good as it gets they've they've hosted the world juniors there uh, I, I don't know if they have... There's, well, the city they suggested was Grand Forks, right? And Grand Forks has quite a few arenas. Grand Forks, nearby. yes, correct. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, would imagine, I, I would imagine there's been NCAA tournament games there. I'm not entirely sure of that, but... I could have sworn they did the Frozen Four there one They did the Frozen not Four in North Dakota? Ago. I would at least, you know, I would imagine there is regionals, but Frozen Four would be... That's pretty impressive, too, if that's the case. Um, I'm, not actually I'm probably that. wrong, so don't quote me on that. Uh, I know North Dakota won. Yes, uh, they, they're, they're very good. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. Don't listen to me. Yeah, I was looking it up real quick, but it's uh, – oh, actually, you know, I've got it right here. Uh, let's see. Not recently. So okay. Good, good call by you. Yep. Uh, 1983. <laughs> Off to a smashing start. 1983 was a uh, – Oh, that's what I was thinking of, 1983. Sure, of course. That was in Grand Forks, so they, they have done it before. Uh, so that's been mentioned, kind of thrown out there as an opportunity for them to kind of get everybody together. I, was it this week, too? I'm sorry. The, the weeks are all overlapping. Uh, but it's been acknowledged. Uh, I think it was Bettman even himself said it's probably unlikely that the regular season concludes. Yeah, it was yesterday, right? That I think he, so, yeah. For the, it seemed like for the first time there was a kind of a lack of optimism, I guess, most of the – pessimism has been on the side of the players but ever since the release that said that they were going to pause the season the league has been for the most part steadfast in their desire to want to award the Stanley Cup this year one way or another yeah and you know with the regular season I could see why they would want to try to resume that I think resuming the regular season is most the 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 biggest importance to that in addition to the the TV you know deals or whatever and making as close to good as you can on regional TV deals. The biggest thing that I thought resuming regular season games would do is to give players an opportunity to refine their legs. Uh, I think it's, it's under, you know, it's understood that there'll be some sort of mini training camp uh, 
you know, for teams to kind of get back up to speed before. It's not like they're just going to make the decision, you know, see all in, you know, June and we'll play the Stanley Cup playoffs in North Dakota. Uh, they're going to get a little bit of a chance. But I thought that, you know, having regular season games would have helped from that standpoint. That being said, I think it's the easiest thing to ax, and it's, you know, just in this progression where it's, right. you know, we have to pause the season. We're going to lose some regular season games. The next thing is we lose all the regular season games, and then after that you lose the playoffs or whatever. So they obviously don't want to get to that last part uh, if they can help it. So not entirely surprising there. Uh, I am completely open to this idea if the health people say it could work. I think this is the only option they have left at this point. And in addition to North Dakota, Manchester, New Hampshire – uh, was mentioned as right. a uh, an opportunity for uh, one of these remote locations. I don't understand. Uh, let me just look this up real quick. I have. Uh, I I, I want to get what you know John Shannon reported it, and I want to make sure we have it correct uh, with what he said. It, do you maybe you know off the top of your head? Was this in addition to North Dakota or as a? No, uh, I think it was oh, it a, a standalone. In, in addition to North Dakota, as. Uh, Elliot Freeman reported over the weekend also hearing Manchester, New Hampshire as a potential site for NHL games. If, and it's a big, if the NHL is to resume schedule over the summer. So I, I mean, hey, I maybe they played that... the Eastern conference in Manchester, they right. played the Western conference in North Dakota. Um, That's what I was know. wondering, but I also like the way it's worded there by John Shannon. I'm not sure if he's, you know, saying in addition to North Car North Dakota right. as a candidate, New Hampshire is also being considered, but that would be wild. I, I think just as somebody who grew up in new England to, the idea of Stanley Cup playoff games going down in, in Manchester, New Hampshire is right. pretty, pretty tough to conceptualize. I mean, the second that came out, my thought was the, the Bruins almost moved to New Hampshire joke that always floats around. That's um, a great joke, too. Yeah, fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think I was going anywhere with that. That's Just, another place, too. Most, most of the arenas would – I like they can't play in front of fans, so who cares where you're playing? Like what the exact location is? Yeah, it's a big enough city. I think there's a handful of hotels where you could house players. Uh, the SNHU Arena is is hosted NCAA regionals and, and things like that before. They've had AHL uh, Calder teams. Cup runs, right? Yeah, right, yeah, uh, they've had AHL teams there. The Monarchs were mm -hmm. one of the better AHL teams before they moved, so. Uh, it's, it's doable. I don't know. I mean, I think we're all just kind of kicking around ideas at this point. I don't, this is, it's news just because it's something we haven't heard yet, but there's not a whole lot of tangible benefit no. to anything that came out this week. Yeah. And I don't think that we're going to get any sort of traction until I forget when the CDC recommendation is for like crowds and whatnot. It's early May at some point, I think Stand until they decide whether that's, is staying in place or being extended, even if the games are being played without fans, like you're going to get more than 50 people there between two hockey teams um, and the personnel that would come with that. So the, I think they're keeping all their options open, but like the rest of us, they're just, they're in a holding pattern. I will say hockey feels like if we're to, if we're to break down which sport, is most likely to not play another game. Well, that's not a good way of putting it. Uh, <laughs> which team Between is baseball season starting or hockey or basketball season ending, I think is what you're getting at. Well, I was going to say – the least likelihood of – Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's just a better way of putting it. I was trying to more find a more encapsulating way of putting it, but there's a chance they return in late 2020 to start next season, so – I don't want to completely rule out the rest of the calendar year for the NHL, but I do think the nature of the sport in terms of the weather is going to affect ice yeah. surface. And it's also, you're dealing with bigger teams. I think it's probably a bigger su support staff for hockey than it is for, for basketball. Uh, and just the fact that baseball can go f deeper into the year uh, if it has to, I think hockey is the most likely to, to lose the rest of the season, but I still yeah. think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves even in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, mean, I asked no you this last week, a scale of 1 to 10, 1 <laughs> being completely pessimistic that hockey returns, 10 being it's a sure thing that we'll have a resumption of this season. Where do you sit uh, this week? I think last week I was at a 4, and that's about where I am still today. Like, yeah, I, uh, I'd be more surprised that if they did play than not. But I'm also not complete, especially with the NHL. Like, I, I really do think – that in terms of, like, you look at who's running the show between Gary Bettman and Adam Silver, I sooner trust Adam Silver 
yeah. to be like, you know what? No, we're not doing this. Then Gary Batman being like, you know, we're going to find a way. And that's, that's not even that much of a indictment of Gary Batman. I just think right from the jump, they wanted to make sure they finished this season and, you know, they, they dug themselves that hole a little bit. And now they have to kind of try and find a way unless they absolutely can't, which they might get put in a position where they absolutely can. Yeah. That's the thing. I, I think everybody's going to try to come back until they're told they can't, you know? Right. And it's going to take somebody a lot smarter and a lot more important than Gary Bettman or Adam Silver, you know, anybody to say, this is just not going to happen. And until that, Mm -hmm. that is said, I think there's still hope and it's going to be interesting. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's going to go against him. the the suggestions of the smart medical people, but that'll be a a fascinating thing to see to kind of play out. I was at a three last week. I'm going to bump up to a four. So I'm with, really. yeah, I, I'm just going off of some of the, it's impossible. It's so hard because it's just the data is two weeks behind at every point. So it's hard to say, but there is a, you know, some slight optimism. It feels like this week, which is a, I feel terrible even using the word optimism in, you know, one day after 700 people die in New York, it's right. You know, it's terrible that we're at this weird spot where like deaths are almost a sign that we're getting out of this, which is just awful to even think about and try to, to, to conceptualize. It's just, it's, you know, that is kind of where we're at, but it does feel like some of these measures are working. The question is going to be, you know, well, if they're working now, will they work even better if we extend them even farther? So there's going to just be a real balancing act that, that is going to have to be done there. So, but, yeah, well, and this is where we put in our weekly disclaimer that it's like there are far more important things than right. sports. If the hockey season doesn't come back, fine, that's probably the right decision. That the, said, you know, we can still kick around ideas and yeah. And the North out. Dakota thing is going to be fascinating because you and I were talking about this on a call before we we got in here. Uh, if they continue to do relatively all right in terms of case number, like, I don't know, is there, if testing gets a little bit better, a little more readily accessible, you know, do you just bring everybody to North Dakota, North Dakota, part of the country that didn't get hit terribly hard and just say, we're bringing one, 2000 people and to your, you know, your spot of the world that has not been hit very hard. And it's just as long as we promise that everybody's okay, okay when we come in, it's, it's going to yeah, be good. Yeah, cross our fingers. Everyone's okay. It is. But, like, when you think about it like that, you're like, this, is a, this, this probably is going to be a risk. And that's – It's a slippery slope. Hell, yeah. Right. And then once you start, you know, the second that you admit that there's risk, you're like, well, what are we even doing? Like, that's what <laughs> worries me is, like, eventually at the end of the day, we're just like, this is a terrible idea. Yeah. But I don't know. What's – uh. What is your f- philosophical opinion on this entire thing? Are you rooting for it to come back, or are you one of these people who just says, uh, no way, no Sel- chance? Yeah. Selfishly, I want it to come back, but not at the expense of people getting sick. Like, that's not worth it. Um, I would much rather they just bag on it right now and say, you know, we're going to hope that by the time – training camp rolls around in September we'll be able to be completely back to normal we'll just start the 2020 2021 season I'm sure if you're the Bruins or you know the Washington Capitals or some team that's played well this year you're pissed but like you know some things are bigger than hockey lots of things are bigger than hockey hockey is a a, a drop in the ocean um compared to everything else in the world so like I'd love to see it back because I like watching hockey but I also don't want people getting sick. I don't want to keep being cooped up in the same spot the entire time, just so that, you know, we can watch hockey games. Like that's, that's where I've kind of fallen on it the whole time. Like just be smart about it. Yeah. It is pretty bad business too. If you, if you rush it back and then people do get sick, you look, you look well, pretty bad. And, and not to go down the rabbit hole too much, but like that was one thing Jeff passed and was talking about with the major league seasons that, they seem to think that if someone gets sick, it wouldn't be this indication that like you have to shut everything down. And it's like, well, how can it not be like that? And that just seems like wishful thinking to me, but. I kind of get that though, depending on, but that's under it the depends assumption. depends on how far along we are. Right? Yeah. I was going to say that's under the assumption that we have better, uh, better testing and tracking and all of that. Like, 
who knows? I mean, it, you know, if you go back two weeks, like the world looked like a completely different place. You go back four weeks, it would be unrecognizable. Who knows where we're going to be six weeks from now, you know? Yeah. So. Well, and that's the thing, too, is there's just you can't forecast anything right now because there's so much uncertainty. Yeah, right. So. So, which actually is the thing that might end up costing these leagues, too, is that just it's going to become so impossible to try to even predict that you're just going to have to kind of bud see, like, throw your hands up and just say, oh, I guess not. I guess we're done. So, uh, all right. That's, uh, that's our weekly check-in with uh, our, our optimism and uh, confidence meter uh, as opposed to uh, regarding whether or not we'll have actual hockey to talk about in the near yeah. future. But uh, we will continue to try to kind of work our way through things here. Uh, and as mentioned, we will, you and I are going to shift it here to a, a conversation about the state of the Bruins defense core. Uh, we talked last week about uh, the goaltending situation, so we'll kind of move into the, the defenseman. Uh, this week, uh, and usually, or um, excuse me, uh, we'll use the the Tory Crew conference call a, as a jumping off point. And before you and I even get into our discussion, the one thing that really stood out from what Crew said earlier this week is, uh, you know, talking about the, his future with the Bruins. He is in the final year of his contract. If they don't get going uh, again, he couldn't. His Bruins career could be done. And he talked about that uh, on the conference call. So I guess we'll let him take it away uh, and explain where he's at with that. Um, for me personally, I, I really hope I did not play my last game as a Boston Bruin. And um, it's been a place for me and my family to grow. And uh, my love for the game and playing in front of these fans is, um, you know, it's been very special to me. But uh, it hasn't given any clarity. I think if, if anything, it's uh, made me wonder about this process a little bit more because, um, you know, I was just in the moment and, and playing games to help my team win. And and hopefully uh, push us in the right direction and win a championship. And now with this uh, season paused, and uh, I've definitely wondered about what's going to happen, but uh, in terms of clarity, there, there pretty much has been none. All right, so that's an interesting take from, from Tory Krug, and it's, it's one that makes sense and probably one that Bruins fans really don't want to think about because that, <laughs> that is a, a, a lose-lose situation. That Not only would you see the rest of the season eradicated and go up in smoke, but uh, the idea of losing – arguably your, what, second best defenseman at this point. Yeah, uh, in terms of offensive production, easily your best. Yeah. yeah. You can, the yeah, turn you can of the make millennium. It, and I think this is a good place to start, too. You can make an argument that Tory Krug is your most of, the most important defenseman. What say you? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I'd yeah. say, all things considered, Charlie McAvoy is probably your best all-around defenseman. Right. But – and will be the most important one in like two years, probably. Well, the, yeah, and this goes back to the conversation we were having the other week about, you know, how do you value a guy like John Carlson versus Roman Yossi? You know, when, that said, Tory Krug has had a, a pretty good time fixing up some of the shortcomings he had in his defensive game. Like, he's certainly uh, rounded things out a little bit in that regard. Listening to the call yesterday, my biggest takeaway was, and this is – fully acknowledging the fact that what happens with the rest of this NHL season could have a very big impact on what salary cap structure looks like going forward. If things have some semblance of normalcy, I don't see how the Bruins, unless they just outright do not want Tory Crew back, don't find a way to get him signed. I, he's, I don't think he's going to take a massive pay cut to stay in Boston, but I also think it's probably being overstated how much he'll get um and and make no mistake goals cost a lot of money right but I think it's Jacob Truba uh John Carlson Brent Burns uh Thomas Shabbat are all making about eight million I don't, I don't know if Tory Crew can make that money because of his defensive shortcomings to me somewhere in the seven to seven and a half million range makes a lot more sense and the Bruins getting out from under 75 percent of the Bacchus contract helps them accomplish that I think it would take a pretty big gap in negotiations for them to not find some sort of ground. I, I, I get the sense that Tory Crew really likes the way his life is going in Boston and that he has found a home there. And if he wants to win, because the theory that's always been floated around is, well, he's from Michigan, maybe he'll go and sign with the Red Wings. The Red Wings are going to be the worst team in the NHL for like the next three years at least. 
I don't know, unless the dollar amount really matters that much to them, which I don't want to tell other people, you know, how they should spend their money. But like, I feel like his future is probably a lot more promising in Boston than it would be in Detroit and possibly elsewhere. The more I think about this, the more fascinated I am with it. Uh, (laughs) Because my initial reaction was, so how many games are they going to end up losing? 20 games, roughly? 10 games? No, well, just teams in general, regular season games. What are the Bruins? Oh, a regular season. Uh, they, Bruins have, what is this, like, they had 12 games remaining, I think. Right. So, regular season games. That's a lot. And if you lose the entire Stanley Cup playoffs, that's a lot, too. Yeah. But that's not 80 games. So, yeah. you know, it's certainly the cap is going to be on the lower end uh, of the projections. I think that's probably fair to assume. But, like, you know, it's not just the Bruins that are going to have to deal with this. So No, not at it's, all. It's what? Tory Krug's market gets – what Tory Krug is looking for in a contract is probably less now than it was six weeks ago. Right. And, and so, here's my thing, too, is I think what you're going to see is, especially depending on how much the salary cap shrinks this year, yeah. they – you're going to start to see a lot of guys, I think, take one-year deals. So I that's you're going to see a say. lot of free agents take one-year deals this year and then assume that the salary cap figure gets fixed uh, back to where it probably will be or should be starting season after next. Then you see guys start to get that those long-term deals. See, I was going to say, I, I have two points. Uh, let's, let me just look this up. Tory Krug turns 29 on Sunday. So – you know, that's – he's still got a long, long time left in his career. Obviously, you know, once you get up to 30, things kind of change a little bit. But, you know, if this entire season gets scrapped, is he going to want to leave this – up? you know, I feel like maybe this is wishful thinking or pie in the sky or whatever. But maybe they all look at it and say, let's see what we can do to bring this back at least one more year and try to make a run considering it just got interrupted. Right. And – Maybe it's easier for him to – maybe players are going to be more likely, as you are kind of talking about, take those short-term deals and then just kind of navigate through the next couple of years and see where you are and then really try to cash in. And that's actually where the, the Detroit thing comes in too is maybe it's a three-year deal with the Bruins, two-year deal with the Bruins, and then kind of reassess things both in terms of the, you know, the, the contractual landscape and the free agent landscape and also what the, where the Red Wings are, if that's something that really is – He's, you know, if that's something he's really considering, or Minnesota, or what, you know, any one of these Midwestern rebuilding teams. So I think it's just one of, you know, there's a lot of that uncertainty hurts the Bruins, but maybe it also helps them in this regard. In I don't know. Term, I, in the short term, I think it helps them. Yeah. Uh, and I think what. I also think it's interesting, but, too. Let me just say the fact that he's making five and a quarter this year, he's already gotten a pretty decent deal under his belt it's not like this is a guy who's getting to real legitimate free agency for the first time right well um, he is but you know what i mean like he's made yeah. a decent amount of money it's not like he's gotten completely hosed right out of sorry yeah go ahead decent paydays you know i think if the, your three-year thing kind of comes to fruition it, it speaks to a bigger situation or whatever where are the Bruins just going to go for it for a couple more years, possibly put themselves in cap hell and then become, you know, what we've seen of the Los Angeles Kings and the Chicago Blackhawks in the last couple of years, where it's like, you know, you're, you're signing your soul over to the devil for a few years of cup runs, but you're going to have to pay the piper for it down the road. Yeah. Um, and that's what happens when you start throwing way too much money at, you know, one, one player. And that's been, that's been the Toronto Maple Leafs method. And, at least right now, it has not worked out too well for them. It kind of flies in the face of everything Don Sweeney's trying to do. I mean, he's paying $18 million for the most productive top line in the NHL. Right. I mean, that was the Chicago thing, too, is that you know, they had to pay yeah, Kane Duncan and Duncan Keith. And, and they're paying you know, $20 million dollars between two players who are regressing while the Bruins have that, you know, you mentioned $18 million invested in a trio that – you know, you could say Bergeron is on the, the downside of his career, but Pasternak is one of the biggest bargains in the league at this point. Marshawn, you know, he's getting up there in age two, but he looks like he's just getting better as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the, you know, those are the kind of places where they have a lot of 
flex, I think that's going to give them the flexibility here to make the Krug deal happen if they want to. You know, you look at the the McAvoy deal, four point nine. That's not a terrible deal either. You know, Carlo, they they got it a manageable number. Uh, <laughs> you know, the John Moore thing. That's you know, you're higher on that than I am, but. The John Moore, that's not a cap crippling figure. No, it's not, but it's also a number that, like, if you can trade him at some point, you're, that's a valuable two and three quarter million dollars if you need it at some point. Yeah. It's manageable in terms of a trade, too. Like, and they have a lot of contracts like that as well, where, yeah. like, I mean, the Krejci thing gets brought up all the time, but he's entering the final year of his contract next year too. So there's, there's a lot of different things they can do if they want to. So. I, I really don't think the Bruins have any sort of untradeable contract for right. someone they reasonably would want to trade. Yep. Like you can move that John Moore deal. Um, you know, take a look at pretty much, you know, if, you know, say they ever wanted to move Charlie Coyle, like they could do that. Right. Like they, after getting out from under the back, it's still like they, they have so much more flexibility. And and again, I think that's that was a deliberate move by Don Sweeney over the last few off seasons. They're in a really good spot. Like the more you think about it, aren't they? As long as they, as long as they're not sharp regression yeah. from veteran players, they're in a very good spot. Yeah, they're gonna be tight up against the cap for the next few years but provided they find a way to bring Krug back but otherwise right, like, that's true but, but that's why it's there right like it'd be silly if they weren't spending money yep. so that they want to compete they don't need to be you know, you know not every team's going to be the Colorado Avalanche where all of a sudden you just build this wagon with prospects of yours and you've got all this cap space um so I mean through the resources with which Don Sweeney's had to build a team he's done a good job so Let's say they, they restart in two months. Uh, I think we're both in agreement here, but this is a, a defense core worthy of a Stanley Cup champion, correct? Yeah. I, and you look at something that within the last two or three years have been regarded as a complete weakness. I mean, now you've got, John Moore is an everyday NHL player, and he's getting healthy scratch. Yeah. Uh, like, he, you know, take uh, Connor Clifton. is a, He's probably a fringe everyday NHL player, but he's getting healthy scratched. Um, like, like they how, have, how valuable then, as a piece is like Jeremy Lazan? Like, right. Well, and that's the thing is like control for the next three years. And he's, he's looked pretty good when he's been on the ice. Like, mm -hmm. well, and one thing that stood out to me about Lozon was that this was, this was back in like February. I think this was before the afternoon game between the Bruins and the Coyotes. This is the game where uh, Lozon ended up elbowing or boarding Derek Stepan and getting suspended. But before that game, one of the things that Cassidy had pointed out that he really liked about Lozon was the fact that when they put him with Matt Grizzly, like, he's very good at putting out fires um, in, in a better way than John Moore and certainly Connor Clifton are able to do. And if you watch closely when they play together, when – Grizzly plays with Lozon as opposed to pretty much anybody else that he reasonably gets paired with. He feels a lot more comfortable in the offensive zone and gets a lot more uh, aggressive, I guess, if you will, because he knows that if he gets burned, Lozon's a pretty good skater for a guy that he's not as big as he ends up always looking. He's only 6'1", six one, but he's six one two oh four. Like he's a, he's a burly kid, but he moves well. And he does a good job getting across the ice and basically shutting down odd man rushes coming the other way in ways that John Moore and most definitely Connor Clifton cannot do. And so I think the kind of byproduct of Lozon panning out so far is that he's made Matt Grizzlick a significantly better player. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I was just looking it up real quick. Um, Oh, I was going to ask you this. Is there, you know, looking into the playoffs, if that happens, I don't think there's like a deep pair that they could roll out there late in the game. If they absolutely had to, you're like, they're going to lose this game. And that's a, again, that seems like a, they've come a long way in a really short period of time in terms of not necessarily building one of the best blue lines in hockey, although you could, you could, you could make that argument. Uh, but it's more, I just think, you know, the ceiling may not be as high, but the floor is certainly much higher than it used to be. Yeah. And I mean, look dependable. at, they're dependable. You know? Right. And I mean, you look at, I don't know, we'll, we'll take the Maple Leafs, for example, where like 
last year, unless it was the Morgan Riley Ron Hainsey combo, like you knew it was going to be a wild ride. Um, right. And so, yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing too about John Moore is that Cassidy really trusts him. Where with pretty much any defenseman that they have up short of Clifton, he has no issues playing every single guy like anywhere from 17 minutes plus each game and I think that's something you don't see from a lot of teams nowadays and you know we've been doing these Bruins encores with the 2011 team and so I'm going back and looking at all these box scores from 2011 you see Adam McQuaid playing like nine minutes a night and it's like they don't have to worry about that anymore where it's like you know they can put Lozon out there for 18 minutes and they'll be fine yeah it's a good spot to be in um, looking ahead after the season too, I, you know, obviously the Krug thing takes up a, a large piece of your uh, mental puzzle, but, uh, I think assuming they, they resign him, they're pretty good for the next few years too. That's the thing you go down this list. I mean, like I said, Krug's going to be 29 this weekend, but he's 29 McAvoy's 22, Carlos 23, Moore even is 29. Grizzlick's 26, Lazan's 22, Clifton 24. Uh, you got Vakaninen coming. I think they're in a pretty good spot. Right, well, that's the thing, too, is they're not completely hosed if Krug leaves. Um, it, like, the offensive production definitely takes a dip, and then things have a different look as Grizzlick's probably your top power play guy, and then McAvoy is on the second unit. But, like, they have such a wealth of left-handed defensive prospects. I mean, right now, they're playing with Lozon and Grizzly. They're playing two lefties on the third yeah. pairing. And, you know, so if Krug walks, then they're moving Grizzly up. And Lozon, you know, is still probably playing on his offside because then you have Akinainen or Zaboral or John Moore playing more. Um, but they have enough depth to where, like, they're – you obviously don't want to le- lose Tory Krug or just let him walk, but it's not like that loss is going to set the Bruins back by a mile. And, and again, to use the Maple Leafs example, I mean, they lost Ron Hainsey, they lost Jake Gardner, they lost Nikita Zaitsev, and they were completely gutted by that. I don't think the Bruins are going to be in that position short of a complete mass exodus that I don't think is going to happen. I agree. You know, very set for the future. I think this is – we talked about the goaltending situation last week. There was a lot more uh, uncertainty regarding that than I think with, there is on the blue line. Uh, and if there's one place you want to be set for the next few years, I, in my opinion, it is this is with the defense. So, uh, you know, Sweeney, a former defenseman, went to Harvard. Not surprising that he's got a pretty smart uh, grasp. That's, of, uh, that's a fair position. point. That's <laughs> a very um, good assessment. What do you think, real quick before we get out of here, what do you think that the defense core looks like next year? I think they find a way to keep Krug, and I think it looks very exactly similar. Exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I think we haven't even talked about Zane Ochar. I think, you know, he's 43. It would be a shame if this is the end of the ride for him. You know, you want to talk about Krug. But let's just assume he comes back at a number somewhat close to the $2 million, They give it one more kick at the can. Yeah. I think you're looking at pretty much the exact same group next year. I, I don't think they're – Sweeney has put himself in a position where he has to be blown away to move guys. Yep. And well, that's the it, thing, too, though. If they, if they think they can bring back the same group next year defensively, maybe there's a player out there on the market this summer that you can make a, make a trade for somehow. You'd have to get creative with the money because, you're, you know, like you said, if you re-sign crew, you're going to be up against it. But they'll have options. I think that's all you can ask for. Yeah. And I think that they – operating they had so little depth defensively in recent years going back to like you know 2016 2017 that it's like it's not the end of the world if you're healthy scratching John Moore yeah like that that is a very good situation to be in so it's like I know the fan base for whatever reason detests him because he makes a little under three million a year but like you could do a lot worse than John Moore as your seventh defenseman. So don't move guys just to move guys. And, and that's been Sweeney's thing for a while is he doesn't make moves just to make them. He, he only does it if he thinks that there's going to be some legitimate benefit to it. So that's why I think that unless Krug walks and or Char retires, we're going to look at the same group next year. And one thing that's really important to keep in mind too, uh, your only UFAs next year, Joakim Nordstrom, who is 
much to your chagrin, a relatively inconsequential loss if he leaves. Strong disagree, but he is probably gone. For the sake of the argument. And then, then it's Krug, Chara, and Halak. And if you're going into – And Miller, Kevin Miller too. But Miller he's too. Gone. So let's just say they get the Stanley Cup final in and it's a very short offseason. Ultimate spins on the Bruins are in a lot better position than a lot of other teams if they only have to worry about, you know, Chara, who's basically a layup, uh, and Krug, who's, you know, probably wants – you know what I mean? Like there's not a whole lot of – their off-season checklist is going to be pretty well, short. Well, it's kind of like this past season, too. Like, right. all they had to do was take care of Carlo and McAvoy. Yeah. And, and, and they took their be... time doing that, but the only other moves they made was, what, Par Lindholm, Brett Ritchie, and Max Legasse. Right. And that's going to be even more valuable this season, this summer, if it's a, if it's a truncated off-season. So, they're yeah. in a good spot. Yeah, but the best spot they were in was, uh, you know, to make a run at the Stanley Cup this year. So, uh, yeah. We'll continue to wait and see whether that's still a realistic possibility. Um, and until we get the uh, decision, otherwise, you and I will be returning every week to discuss some other relatively ambiguous uh, <laughs> subject matter. We're so, finding a way. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Logan? No, that's all. Let's get out all of right, here. All uh, right. Let's get out of here. Let's go back to our uh, Groundhog Day lives and uh, do other things that uh, are not uh, related to this. Uh, and we'll continue to do the same thing and just grind away. We'll come back next week. So. Uh, Logan, always good to catch up with you. Uh, We will do it again one week from now. Uh, This has been the Nesson Brewers Podcast. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.